So I'm going to kick off with my fast pitch. So give me a grade if you like. The United States is on course for a retirement train wreck because wealth, advice, and guidance is primarily available only to those who already have money. We have rising markets, lower investment fees, robos, 401ks, IRAs, tools, and advisors on every corner. Yet 80% of working Americans are lost. A majority have saved less than $50,000. 53% guess what they need for retirement. Although a third have an advisor, less than half of those have a written plan to achieve their goals. Human advisors want people with money already. Online, the industry keeps offering hammers and screwdrivers in the Home Depot aisle when people need someone to help them create their vision to design and build the house. They don't need another product, microsaver, or sales gimmick for a bank. Leo's the solution. I've been, spent my career really helping people retire, developing products, and this is what led to Leo. Leo leads people to retirement and financial success from beginners to advanced. Our unique product, automated, online, policy-based, active guidance, helps clients create attainable goals, actionable paths to save, select their appropriate you know, investment allocations, and most importantly, actively, proactively lead them there, step by step. Leo is a fiduciary, and guidance is complete and comprehensive. Most client accounts, like your IRAs and 401ks, can be linked to our platform. Our business model is unique too. We charge only a low monthly subscription fee, about the same as your favorite streaming service, and sell no investment products. We will distribute first as an employee benefit, sold through payroll, 401k providers, and the like, and yet when people leave their employer, they'll be able to keep their account because there is also a B2C option. We will then expand to people like Joe back there who want to take on clients as they grow and want a financial advisor through the Leo Professional Dashboard. Our prototype is complete. We are now actively seeking LOIs from channel partners and developing our social media and socializing with investors. So if you have introductions in any of those you could provide for us, it would be greatly appreciated. Okay, great, any comments? So what are we trying to do here? I mean, the real key here is think about that. How many people, how many of you know what you need to retire? Hands up, how, ma how many of you know the number you need to have saved by when you want to retire? Good for I'm you. Retiring. Oh, you're retiring. So how many in the group? I mean, two or three? In three weeks. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> so, so. Of course, I've been working since I've been 10 years old. And I can tell you a lot of people, with, I can ask that question of a lot of people who have financial advisors and investment managers. Oh, stay back. I forgot the camera. I move around. I was having a conversation with a lady who actually manages a venture capital fund a couple of months ago. And we were talking about this and her allocations and her investment management and her choices. And I just asked her, do you know how much you actually need when you want to start creating your own paycheck? And she kind of looked at me for a minute and said, no. I've tried to get that out of my financial advisor, but he never wants to do that. I mean, I'm guessing this woman has a couple of million dollars with this advisor. So imagine what it's like when you're just starting out. Financial advisors get paid off of money, and that's why the statistics look like this. 66% of Americans have less than 50,000 saved. It's not just because of pay or income disparity or wealth, it's because they can't get help. Historically, our nation depended on pensions. Does anybody know how old the 401k plan is? About 30. The 30, the first ones were in the 80s. They didn't really start hitting into any popular stride until about 1995. So what we did was go from a society where you worked for a company for a long time, your employers helped you plan your retirement, to here, do it yourself, save it yourself, you figure it out. Oh, by the way, 
Here's a little pamphlet that tells you how to do it. You know, we have, this is an industry populated by people with lots of initials, like not just PhDs, but CFA, CFP, CPAs, and attorneys. And somehow we expect people to be able to do their own financial plan when most people, not to put down plumbers, but they don't change out their own toilet. So why do we expect them to be able to do this? And really, this is the problem in our society. We're not really helping people. When, when our clients are looking for help, their solutions are do it yourself online, which means you have to have knowledge, time, and commitment. You can go to a financial advisor, like a big firm, and I can tell you more and more they have minimums. You can't get an account with Merrill Lynch unless you have a half million dollars. Unless maybe you're on the phone inside. A half a million dollars. The Edward Jones guy over here still has no minimum. But who are you going to get? Not to knock Edward Jones, I've trained thousands of them. They're an ethical bunch of people, but who are you going to get if you're just starting out? Is the top producer going to make time for you or probably suggest the new guy or gal down the street? who also banged on your door three times in the last week. You can go to life insurance people. Here's a common example of that. My son graduated from, before he went to law school, he just graduated from law school, but in between, he's like, I want to start saving. He was working for a year. Oh, sorry. He calls up this friend who worked for a big insurance company, because he worked for us, his dad, and said, I want to start an IRA. They gave him a proposal for an annuity. If you've ever looked at an annuity, they take out half the money you pay, especially in the first year, is going to fees. It's not going in your account. I said, you don't need that. Tell them you just want a Roth IRA and some mutual funds. You can do this online. You can go to Edward Jones. Well, I want to do business with my friend. They kept presenting him the annuity. They kept doing it. They would not just present him something simple. That's a common experience. They weren't just going to offer what he needed. They, they wanted the extra package. And you're really good fee-based advisors. They're putting a lot of time into people, but they still have minimums. As a matter of fact, it's hard to get in the door if you don't have $250,000 there anymore. I'm not knocking you, Joe. It's a business model. Because <laughs> Joe loves what we're doing here. So how are we going to take this online? Because I can tell you right now what's online, like I said, is kind of like saying to people, you want to build a house, let's go over here to Home Depot on King's Highway. There's lots of tools, there's lots of materials. Do you know how to do it? That's really what E-Trade, TD Ameritrade, and those are really built around. So if we're going to take this online, though, it can't just be input-output. We have to be able to guide people through an experience. One of the, my favorite analogies is who's used TurboTax? Do you use the Q&A side or you just fill out the form? Some people fill out the form. I'm a tax attorney and I use the Q&A side. Why? Because I, I, it, I understand where it's taking me. I don't have to keep up on everything. It takes you through a journey. Now they have something going for them called April 15th. <laughs> well, hey, you're going to retire some days a little less incentivizing until you start to get there and go, oh my God. So we've got to be able to engage people. We've got to be able to take them through a journey that has the average person able to understand what we're doing. And so what we did was really come up with a scheme, a, a, a process built around Flipping the switch, flipping the perspective of financial advice. Financial advice to this day is based on numbers and accounting and processes are based around the advisor. And somehow you as the client are supposed to follow this. That doesn't work online. And it really doesn't work for most people. Behavior is what makes the difference in success. So we have to encourage and incentivize behavior. So it means we had to redesign how financial advice looks to the client and break it down into its simplest behavioral levers. A 
goal, has a path, you invest, and you have to do the stuff. Execute and remind and stay on path and adjust. So what we've done is give a large kind of half amorphous universe of planning, simple behavioral context that actually becomes kind of a storyboard, which I, we can gamify, which we can use visual indicators instead of numbers, which we can actually incent behavior, and that's what matters. This is really built around an attitudinal market study that Forrester started doing in the financial services industry about 20 years ago that I really believe has application to the tech world as a whole for expanding the reach of who tech can help. Because really it applies to anybody, any way we're trying to give, give people advice and guidance. There's actually a fourth group on this attitudinal survey, attitudinal segmentation called avoiders. But that's pretty much a non-market, so we're going to avoid the avoiders. So going from left to right in level of engagement, from actually little engagement to a lot, we have self-directors, validators, and delegators. Self-directors don't care about advice. They want information, they make their own decisions, they want price, they want execution, they want you to just do it when they say do it. In the investment world, they love E-Trade, Schwab, TD Ameritrade, online brokers that really are giving them low price and all the information so they can make their own decisions. I'm going to go to the other end, to delegators. Because the world's really been built around the two ends. Delegators love the Edward Jones guy who goes to church with them, or their kids play soccer together. Trust isn't about, hey, you've got a company that's solid. It's about, you've got a company that's solid, oh, I like you, I know you. It's an emotional relationship. And what the client's seeking here is, here, take it from me. Keep me up to date. Engagement isn't about explain it to me. Engagement is about make recommendations. Let me know things are going well and send me occasional birthday cards. The validator has long been ignored by the industry. So it's not just an opportunity of people don't have wealth so they aren't getting help, but validators aren't even satisfied by the current dynamic. <laughs> validators value advice. They do a little research on their own, enough to understand. What they really want is interaction. I like to say it like this. Remember your 10th grade algebra teacher? He or she said, I don't care that your answer was right. You didn't show me your work. You get no credit. That's a validator. Validator wants to see you. They want you to take them there. They want you to they want to be engaged in a process that gives them advice and helps them understand where you're going. For even the people who have money, a lot of advisors don't like doing that because that takes time. That means I'm spending more time with a client when I could be out calling 10 more to get 10 new clients. And that's exactly how they think. I mean, that's how their revenue models are built. I need more money in the door, so I'm making more money, managing more money. So they're not incentivized to spend time with you. Now, people who are your fee-based advisors actually do pretty well with this because they're working on an amount that's really about the money under, time, under management with them, and so the amount of time they spend is, can be allocated more to clients. But again, that's really just available to people with lots of money. The reason I believe this has a lot of application to tech as a whole, the self-director world, is input-output. That's where tech's been until now. We're starting to see it. We're starting to see things like chatbots, but chatbots aren't the answer. They're just another tool in the, in the box. Engaging people is not just engagement in a gamification way or keep them interested. It's at what level are we keeping them interested? Are we actually satisfying their need to understand the recommendations and the advice and guidance we're giving them. So it's obviously got to be UX oriented and engaging that way like Candy Crush. But it's really got to get to the, you're actually showing me something and guiding me. So 
This is an example of some of the wonderful work done by Bill and Chris. Advertise for Bill and Chris, cha-ching. <laughs> um, Bill did our UX designs. Chris is our CTO. We have a demo. It's, it's a process designed to walk you through creating goals and then give you the level of information you want as you work through the process. There's a lot of competition in this, but really when it comes down to automated guidance, there's really just one competitor right now. And that's Peffin, who advertises themselves as the world's first AI financial planner. Um, I think they're targeting themselves really well for a nice niche market. I, I prefer to soften it up a little bit. The tagline on the website right now says, there's one line in there that says AI guided by human advice, human wisdom. You know, it, it, I want to modify this. AI is a tool. It's not the answer. It makes this more effective. Engagement and process is what makes this work. Um, there's some big players in the world. Number one is Charles Schwab. And everybody in the industry fears them because they have more money under management than anybody, about six or seven trillion dollars. It's also an industry, though, where we'll use our two local examples, big ones. Edward Jones has maybe a one and half to one three quarters percent market share. Wells has about a two percent market share. Lots of money is played, is made, I mean, by playing in small percentages of the market. Um, Schwab's probably one of the biggest potential competitors in this. They have an online system, they, with hybrid with advisors they call intelligent guidance, intelligent advice. Um, Schwab knows how to play well with others though. Schwab does really well and never trying to squash out all the competition because they're usually getting money like they probably would from Leo. Schwab, I think, would be a channel partner for us. So we want to distribute, we'll have a B2C, but we're really going for channel partners. A lot of my background is in employee benefits and 401k industry, both as an attorney and building and guiding and managing products and strategies at Edward Jones. And so I know this industry. About half your employers don't care about their employees, but the other half actually want to keep them around. And if you can give them away for five to ten dollars a month, they'll make their employees happier and actually able to use their 401k plan, they're going to be interested. And then the ultimate evolution is to create a dashboard for professionals. So you go to, you decide you've been really successful, but you want a human that maybe works off the system. You go to Joe, who has Leo Professional. You can link up. If you like Joe, you can keep it there. If you don't, you can turn it off. You're on your control. When you go to your estate planner, your CPA, they can have a dashboard from Leo. Mortgage brokers, so we see a lot of potential here for linking because you own your financial wallet in addition to your goals and your guidance. I'm a big follower of Michael Porter and competitive strategy. If you cannot tell me how you're affected by the five, fact, five forces, the five factors, you know, I wonder if you've really analyzed where you are in the business and what kind of issues you have. Um, we differentiate really in ways because it's the revenue model and the online is something that an Edward Jones cannot duplicate. They are built completely around face-to-face -face interaction. They could put in something like this in a hybrid system. But where we really differentiate is we sell no investments. By going pure subscription and linking to quality investments, we put ourselves in a position we are 100% about the client, period. And we won't compromise that. I know someday some VC is going to say, but you can make more money doing this. And that's going to be a tough fight. And it's just going to have to prove out that this is, the, this is really a, a solid way of doing business. So that's it. I don't have a team slide because a couple of people have jobs and competitors, so I really can't publicly <laughs> say who they are. Um, but Chris is our CTO. Bill helped us out with UX. They do a wonderful job. Um, All right, got a couple of financial people, and, and I just picked up a salesman. All right. Cool. Who wants to kick off questions? Oh, and the guy who found your checkbook returned it. It's up there by your mouth. Oh, he brought it down here? Mm -hmm. Nice. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> so my bag was open. It fell out. It seems your competitive analysis is good. Um, 
I didn't see a, a plan to market and engage customers. I did see the percentages of what millennials need, Gen Xers need, uh, but I didn't see, I guess, a marketing plan to sell. Yeah, I don't have it here. The main marketing plan really is to create channel relationships with payroll providers, but go up to the platforms. I'll give you an example. My girlfriend's brother owns a payroll company in St. Charles. He does payroll in HR. He's on a platform called ExecuPay that has about 500 to 1,000 franchisees or users in the country. They package these things. So exec, we go to ExecuPay, for example, Please we're talking Please fix their UIUX. Huh? Awful. Yeah, I know. Okay, so anyway. But the point is to go to ExecuPay, a PEO like in Sparity. We're having discussions with, with them right now. And to go to these and say that we're utilizing their salespeople to sell these along with payroll and 401k. So it becomes very much a B2B marketing plan. Then we engage the employees as they sign up. But it really occurs one, one, one B2B interaction at a time. But each one of those B2Bs is servicing 10,000 customers. So if I go to a payroll company like ExecuPay and it goes on their platform, now they have 1,000 distributors serving a million clients. And so it's really going through their distribution channel. All right. You know, well, you and I have talked a lot about this. Um, and I, I, you know, I hope it gave you a good ad there. No, change. no, and I, I totally Just agree with what you're doing. I mean, it's, um, it gives tangible goals for people, it gives you know, actual items. My question is, and we've never discussed this, I can't believe it, is you talk about how you're not a provider of the investments. Could you talk about how that interaction works between you know, eventually owning a mutual fund and how you're how you were set up to do that? Well, this hasn't been built yet, but the, the plan, which is very, it's very executable, is to have direct links with selected investment partners. Um, so that you go through the system, and if you don't have an IRA already set up, we'll have, sh we'll have selections from people who clear our bar as to quality and fiduciary. For example, I could tell you Vanguard and Schwab are probably, you know, probably right at the top of the list. Why? Because they're very inexpensive. They're quality. We can manage them. There's not a lot of fluff there. Um, data sharing is easy. For less than a dollar a user a month at initial stages, at scale, it gets down to pennies. We can link through Yodely or MX. And I've been looking at MX. Um, and collect all the data on about any financial account, including your 401k in the country. So we can gather the information to help you make the decisions. There's also technology out there, like for example, there's a competitor that does nothing other than allocate 401k accounts that actually can go in and tap into your account through data scraping and reallocate you. You know, their technology is there to be able to actually go into other accounts and make the adjustments. So it's a matter of the tech build over time so linking up and creating executables is expensive, but it's very doable within the scheme of things. It'll start out narrow in scope. Obviously, it's got to just work with what we, you know, it's going to be progress over time with the money. Um, I, I love what you're doing, and this is really, really amazing. When I think about like my personal story of like coming, uh, coming back from Afghanistan, 2011 being 21 years old and having like $50,000 in the banking, not having the knowledge of like what to do and how to plan for my future. Um, do, you, do you see like the future of your company also helping the younger gener generations? Oh, it's absolutely targeted to millennial Gen X. I mean, let's also remember millennial doesn't describe the kids in college now. Millennials are out of, well, in, in, you know, in theory. Millennials are all 25 and older now. 24. <laughs> so when you blame the kids on college, those damn millennials, as the old white guys do, you know, you're, you're not talking about millennials in college anymore. Yeah, that, it's the, now the Gen, Gen Z. The kids that were raised with bike helmets when they walked to the bus. I mean... That was a picture we used to use at Edward Jones to describe the generation from 2000 on. They were very pampered because we lived in risky times. 
Um, but back to your point, military is something that comes from that. One, there was a week in um, October, investment news cover, as a picture of a major in the Air Force and his wife, and it says, military, worthy of our advice, but they ain't getting it. I'm paraphrasing the headline for effect, but that was the article. And this really goes to that client too. Military and veterans, government employees, a lot of people who still do have pensions have benefits, but no assets. At least their big bulk retirement assets. That's where people have their money if they do. So advisors don't want to give them time unless they're like within a year of a rollover. Then everybody's on you like flies. So military is, is one of those affinity groups that we're looking into how to break into. If you uh, no, in ed tech or like or almost like educators. Educators would be a great market too. I think it's right now it's a matter of we're exploring those and where there's a weak spot. I'm not going to sit here and tell you I'm going to build this for military and veterans. We're having those conversations, and if there's a penetration point there, versus on the other hand, I had a call from a guy who represents coaches out of DC last week nationally. He's like, I love this. Why? Coaches, everybody's not Nick Saban making 10 million a year, or even Barry Odom making three. There's a lot of, he started a business in there for volleyball coaches. You know, a Division I volleyball coach makes 150 grand a year and they move around. He's like, these people need help. He saw this as instantly. He's like, there's, and they all talk to each other. So it's finding, right now we're exploring the weak points. And you might say, the penetration points. James. Who is your target market? That's the first question. Um, the Venn diagram is, let's bring up there, it's a validator. So that's going to be a self-selected audience based on what's presented. But that's also what I did not tell you. Validators are 50% of the people in the marketplace. Yet we've built an entire industry around 18% self-directors and 25% delegators.